Allow me to define for you what a parachurch ministry is. A parachurch ministry is a ministry that exists outside or supposedly alongside the ministry of a local church. Parachurch ministries being autonomous and separate from local church ministries, though popular, are not scriptural. I can think of seven reasons why members of Calvary Road Baptist Church should not involve themselves in parachurch ministries such as the Gideons, such as Campus Crusade for Christ, now Crew, such as Women's Bible Fellowship, Manna, or even some Bible study, however innocuous it may seem, that is not a ministry of your church. And I'm looking around to see if I have anyone here that I might offend by this, and I see no one that I might offend, so I'll just go for it. Reason number one, in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, the Apostle Paul describes gifted men given by the Lord Jesus Christ to congregations for the purpose of equipping Christians to serve God. I maintain that someone other than pastors who teach you interfere with what your pastors are teaching you and thereby obstruct the biblical ministry that they seek to discharge as the gifted men given to a church. Reason number two, Matthew chapter 18 verse 15 and following prescribes the proper steps for dealing with a church member who has sinned against you. I maintain that someone who is teaching the Bible to you who is not a fellow member of the church you are in is not subject to your church's discipline and therefore cannot be properly held accountable for whatever error that person may teach. Reason number three. James chapter three, verse one warns, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Here, James warns his readers that folks ought not to be so quick to presume that because they can teach the Word of God, they should teach the Word of God, the word master meaning, in this verse, teacher. I maintain that Bible teachers are scripturally used when they are under the discipline and authority of their local church instead of in some parachurch ministry that is not authorized by God's word and not under the oversight of God-called pastors. Reason number four. I find it insulting to the ministry of a local church for folks to have time to involve themselves in a parachurch ministry while not seeming to have time to attend all of the services in their own church. Oh, you've got time for that, but you don't have time for this. I well remember a teacher in graduate school, Dave Hawking, who used to pastor the fastest growing church in the United States and was the radio Bible teacher for the Biola Hour, saying that his study of the issue of parachurch ministries convinced him that folks involved in parachurch ministries were of little use to their own churches diverting time, energy, prayers, and financial resources to ministries that are simply not a part of God's plan for this age. Reason number five, I seriously question the ethics and the qualifications of someone who has seized upon an unscriptural ministry as the means of teaching members of the flock over which I am the under-shepherd and thereby ingratiating himself to members of the congregation that I am responsible to the chief shepherd for. Experience has taught me that such unscrupulous teachers will then presume to provide counseling to those church members who would normally seek my counsel, foisting upon naive and unsuspecting church members unscriptural doctrines and a philosophy of ministry that is incompatible with our church's direction. Reason number six, 
you might want to turn in your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2, 3, and 4, or you can just listen to me read the passage where the Apostle Paul writes, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. This was Paul's warning to young Pastor Timothy. Parachurch ministries almost universally have departed from the preaching of God's word to the softer teaching of God's word. And it's no wonder such ministries are an end time symptom of the slide into spiritual apostasy. People who are rebellious to God's plan for the church will not stand for authoritative preaching that is confrontational and scriptural, but will join together with others who are likewise rebellious in their unwillingness to submit their undeniable organizational and instructional skills to the authority of a pastor. If it stopped at that, the damage would be minimal, but the parachurch people won't keep to themselves, always making sure that they lure and entice gullible and immature Christians from good churches to attend their ill-conceived activities and ministries with them. There has been an explosion of involvement in parasitic, or should I say, parachurch ministries in recent years that tracks parallel to the tendency of Americans to claim they are born again while having the same divorce rates, while having the same abortion rates, and while having the same alcoholism rates as those not professing Christ, and all the while abandoning vital doctrines that are prominent in God's word. Parachurch ministries are a part of the problem, not a part of the solution. Last but not least, such parachurch ministries, with many characteristics like those the Apostle Paul predicted to Timothy in the passage I read moments ago, join with others in the end-time apostasy in departing from important doctrines that are clearly taught in God's word and emphasized as being important. What doctrines, you might ask? Many, I assure you, their doctrine of sin is shallow. Their doctrine of Jesus Christ deviates enough from Scripture so as to subtly lead sinners away from the true Savior. Their doctrine of hell is cooling off. Their doctrine of salvation is pure decisionism. Their doctrine of sanctification excuses clearly unsaved behavior as being supposedly backslidden Christian conduct. Their doctrine of the church explains their lack of personal accountability and their unwillingness to submit to congregational authority and pastoral equipping ministry. Their doctrine of personal and ecclesiastical separation from ungodliness and worldliness is virtually non-existent. Instead, they generally substitute some t kind of Christian mush and feel-goodism for scriptural milk and doctrinal meat. What particularly gets my dander up, and it's hard to get my dander up, is the tendency of parachurch ministries, as well as almost every church found in Southern California, to severely water down and pollute what God says about himself in his word, especially the wisdom of, of fearing God. If you ask the typical evangelical or parachurch ministry Bible teacher concerning the fear of God, you will almost certainly hear that person say something like this. Oh, we certainly should fear God. Oh, my, yes, my, my, yes, we should fear God. Yes, God deserves our respect and our reverence. Oh, yes, he does. 
But if you ask that person if he or she has ever taught or will ever teach that God is one who is to be feared, in whose presence one is to tremble, the answer will most definitely be, no, God doesn't want his children to be scared of him. But is that so? Is that really so? Why then is God termed in the Bible the fear of Isaac? Why is God to be revered with reverence and godly fear? Hebrews 12, 28. And have you ever noticed what happens to every person in the Bible who finds himself in close, close proximity to the presence of God? Perhaps this is why Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 13 encourages the reader to quote, Let him be your fear and let him be your dread. And perhaps this is why Nehemiah described God as quote, the fear of his people. Close quote. I don't think a member of Calvary Road Baptist Church should inv involve himself or herself in a parachurch ministry. I gave seven reasons why I hold such a strong opinion on this matter, but perhaps there is one more I can leave you with as I approach my message from God's Word, and that's Psalm 34, verse 11. Psalm 34, verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of of the Lord. Though I am committed to teaching you the fear of the Lord and and that fear should be reflected in every aspect of our combined worship, it's not at all likely such truth will be taught in any parachurch ministry. Do you work with a Christian who is involved in parachurch ministries? If so, I would caution you to be mindful of two truths that are almost certainly uh, to be found with that individual. First, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, where it is revealed that individual isn't mature enough even to know right from wrong. So you shouldn't presume his or her wisdom to make a decision about involvement in a parachurch ministry. The passage reads, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And so you have no right to presume, I have no right to presume, that someone who is not a mature grounded, steady man or woman of God has it in them to decide what's right and what's wrong. And if they're involved in a parachurch ministry, they have clearly demonstrated to you that they don't know the difference between right and wrong. Second, consider Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7, suggesting what I passed over quickly moments ago. That person is in rebellion against the pastor or the notion of a pastor. Read this passage with me and noting that those referred to here can be none other than pastors. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God. It's not talking about your Bible study reader at work, leader at work, no. Whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation. May God bless you as you steer clear of unscriptural pseudo-ministries and as you cautiously seek to persuade those you know who claim to be Christians to involve themselves in a church ministry. Please turn at this time in your Bible to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, when you find that place in God's Word, I invite you to stand for the reading of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom 
and instruction. Won't you please be seated? Back in the days when students in high school took courses dealing with the history of Western civilization, they don't anymore. Even in major universities, they don't anymore. Uh, there was an era of history generally referred to back in the days when these things were taught, and that era in history was known as the Dark Ages. It was a time in European history when anarchy was the rule rather than the exception and when the lot in life of those who lived in Europe was bleak and dreary indeed. But what, what, what few public school students and what fewer parochial school students likely had pointed out to them was that this era of European history was when the Church of Rome was in the ascendancy and enjoyed an influence and authority over the lives of everyday people unmatched during any other time in history. It was a time that the late Cardinal Timothy Manning, who used to preside over the Los Angeles Archdiocese, but it was a time that the late Cardinal Timothy Manning described as the Golden Age of Rome. What everybody else called the Dark Ages, he, in his doctoral dissertation or his master's thesis, can't remember specifically which one, described that era in Europe as the Golden Age of Rome. Of course, the Roman Catholic Church now looks back on that time with embarrassment because of the excesses of the Roman church that have come to light and, and because of the poverty and ignorance of the people under her spiritual care at that time. But I disagree with most historians on one count. I am of the personal opinion that from a spiritual perspective, the Dark Ages of Europe was a spiritually better time in human history than was the latter half of the 20th century here in the United States of America, as well as this time in which we now live. Let me phrase it another way. I think an illiterate and downtrodden European during the Dark Ages was better off spiritually than many of the people that you know may be with their luxury and educational background and their accumulation of possessions. Uh, though he was life-infested, uh, lice-infested, and filthy, though he was a virtual slave to the Roman Catholic Church and to the local nobility, he may have been better off than many of the people that you know are. You see, the average European during the Dark Ages feared God. That's something that no one you know who is not saved would be described as being. You don't know any unsaved people who fear God. And yet for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, an entire continent, the continent of Europe, was populated by people that despite their unsaved, their lost condition, they feared God. That's not the case here. That's not the case with anyone that you know who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior. Many people erroneously con conclude that a person who fears God is some poor peasant given over to superstition and ignorance. But I submit to you that a person who fears God knows more than most people know at least about the spiritual world, and, and the Word of God backs me up. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My message is, is to you who do not fear God, whether you're here in the auditorium or watching this later uh, by means of technology. It is not a message designed to scare you, Neither is it a sermon that presents the gospel so that you might be enticed into making a false profession of faith. Rather, this is a sermon that will show you that there is something wrong with you who do not fear God. If you're here and you do not fear God, there is something wrong with you. There's not something wrong with me on this issue. There's something wrong with you on this issue. And I can back it up. Solomon declared that the fear of the Lord is the beginning 
of knowledge. This doesn't mean you don't know anything if you don't fear God. But it does mean that if you do not fear God, you don't know anything about spiritual matters. You don't know anything about issues that are eternal. You don't know anything about subjects that really matter. And it certainly means you know nothing about God. If you are so ignorant about things that really matter that you don't even know enough to fear God, then there is something terribly, terribly wrong with you. You may be convinced by those around you and you may be convinced yourself that that you're cool or or that you're somehow marvelous and sophisticated uh, in your thinking. You may even be convinced that you are right with God, but the Bible shows very clearly otherwise. If you are a person who does not fear God, there is much wrong with you. Let me point out to you seven things that you do not know if you don't know enough to fear God. First, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know His omnipresence. Omnipresence is a long word that means God is everywhere at once. Another word that describes God's size is the word immense. God is immense, but so are blue whales immense as are elephants. God, on the other hand, is immense to an infinite degree. He is so immense that he is omnipresent, which is to say that God is everywhere. There are many passages in the word of God which point out or remark about God's immensity, his enormity, his omnipresence. But there is one passage which wonderfully describes the attribute of God uh, of of omnipresence in, in wonderful poetic language. I want you to turn in your Bible to the 139th Psalm, Psalm 139. And we're going to read together. I will read aloud. I invite you to read silently verses 3 through 13. Psalm 139, beginning with verse 3, Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? And, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Now what does this have to do with the fear of God? Consider this. Human beings are afraid of immensity. We are fearful of enormity. A little child has to be taught not to be afraid of the great big man. Okay? The immensity and the enormity of ornate cathedrals and imperial palaces and governmental buildings are an... are an intentional effort on the part of the architects to strike fear into the hearts of those who behold such great structures. That's big. That's important. Me, on the other hand, I'm so little in comparison. I'm so small. It creates reverence for the authority of the church or the state to occupy such impressive structures. Go to downtown Los Angeles and look at the big federal building and look at the big city buildings and you'll see the philosophy behind it. If you do not fear God, it is because you have absolutely no grasp 
of his enormity, his immensity, his omnipresence. That's one. Next, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know his omnipotence. I read Deuteronomy chapter 10 beginning with verse 12. I invite you to read along. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways and to love him and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command thee this day for thy good. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. In other words, God is saying, it's all mine. Verse 15, only the Lord had a delight in thy fathers to love them, and he chose their seed after them, even you above all people as it is this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, which regardeth not persons nor, ta nor taketh reward. He doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger in giving him food and raiment. Love ye therefore the stranger, for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, him shalt thou serve, and to him shalt thou cleave and swear by his name. He is thy praise, and he is thy God, that hath done for thee these great and terrible things which thine eyes have seen. Thy fathers went down into Egypt with threescore and ten persons, and now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Wow. Wow. Why should the Israelites have feared God? Because of the great and terrible things which they had seen him do with their own eyes. The ten plagues in Egypt. The Passover of the death angel. The parting of the waters of the Red Sea. The pillar of smoke by day and the pillar of fire by night, referred to as the Shekinah glory in the Talmud. The fire that killed Nadab and Abihu for their attempt to sacrifice with strange fire. The earth swallowing up Korah and his followers. The earth just opened up and swallowed those guys. And the, the Israelite people saw it. The manna from heaven for 40 years and they saw it every day. The presence of God on Mount Sinai. They looked up and they saw the lightning and the thunder and the clouds and the rumbling. All of these things served to convince the Jewish people that they were dealing with a being of incomprehensible might and power. But consider in addition to those things the fact that God created the physical universe with but a spoken word. That he created man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he hung the stars and that he presently sustains all things. I know women who are afraid of guns but who do not fear God. I know men who are afraid of dogs but who do not fear God. For decades, the civilized world lived in fear of nuclear holocaust, but those same people did not fear God. Still others fear fire, but not God. Fear cancer, but not God. Fear sexually transmitted diseases, but not God. Fear global warming, but not God. And are terrified of catching the CCP virus, but do not fear God. Excuse me, but human beings are such creatures that unless trained otherwise, we have a natural tendency to fear incomprehensible power and might. That's just the way we're wired. It is normal for every human being to be this way unless experience and training has taught him otherwise. But there has been no training or experience with God that has thus taught humanity to not fear him. 
How then do you explain the utter and complete lack of any fear whatsoever for God among human beings or with you? Simple. It's simple. And if you disagree with me, at least have the courage to approach me and tell me you disagree. The reason you do not fear God, despite having never been taught not to fear God, is because you are devoid any understanding of God's great and omnipotent power. You don't get it. That's on you. That's not on God. That's on you. You have no exposure to it in your heart. You have no comprehension of it in your soul. That's you. For if you but thought deeply about this one who created the heavens and the earth and all that in them is, and if you thought for just a little while deeply about the astonishing power that had to be brought to bear for such creative acts to occur, you would fear him. And if you don't fear him, it's because you're a numbskull. It's because your bird bath shallow and you never give attention to important things. That's on you. Third, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know his omniscience. I, I have so far used three words that begin with the Latin preposition omni. Uh, to make sure you understand what I'm saying, I need to define the word omni. It simply means all. Okay, for example, an omnidirectional antenna is an antenna that works with equal efficiency in all directions. In like manner, omnipresence refers to being present in all places. Omnipotence means having all power and omniscience refers to knowing all things. God is omniscient. Because he knows everything. Listen to this portion of Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. God declares the end from the beginning because he knows the end from the beginning. Listen to just one example of the Bible's pronouncement of all knowledge using a poetic phrase. I'm reading from Proverbs chapter 5 and verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. You see that phrase, the eyes of the Lord. That's a poetic phrase that's used many, many times in the Old Testament to emphasize the fact that God knows everything. And, 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 and what should inspire fear in men from God's omniscience? What should inspire fear in women from God knowing everything? Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, Every place. Every place. Beholding the evil and the good. He sees you. He always sees you. There are certain things that if anybody found out, you would be so embarrassed, so humiliated, you would never want the people you know to ever see you again. And yet you don't seem to care that God sees it already. If God sees everything, if God knows everything, even the secrets of your heart, then he will certainly judge what he sees, even judging according to the secrets of your heart. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 2 and verse 16. 
If that doesn't make you fear God, then you are worse than a brute. You're dumber than a stump. You have the intelligence of a flat rock. If that doesn't make you fear God, then you are worse than some cur that's disobeyed its master and, and at least has enough sense to fear getting a swap with a rolled up newspaper from its owner. Even dumb dogs are smart enough for that. And if that doesn't make you fear God, then you're just a simple fool. <laughs> if that doesn't make you fear God, then you just do not know his omniscience. Fourth, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know his holiness. Five brief stories to illustrate. First, there was Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, told to offer sacrifices using only fire that came from a fire originally started by God. Those two adult sons of the high priest decided to use ordinary fire from an ordinary campfire termed strange fire by God. What did God do to those two for in that way violating his holiness? He killed them. He killed them. Leviticus chapter 24. What happened to the Israelite woman's son who blasphemed and took the name of the Lord in vain? He was put to death by stoning. Why? With his speech he had violated God's holiness so he had to die. 1 Samuel chapter 6 the Ark of the Covenant was seized in battle by the Philistines. After seven months of affliction from God in the form of hemorrhoids, emeralds in the King James Version, the Philistines returned, to, returned the Ark to the vicinity of a community known as Beth Shemesh. When the curious Jewish men of Beth Shemesh who knew perfectly well that it was God's ark they were beholding, decided to satisfy their curiosity and look inside the ark. What did God do? He killed more than 50,000 men. Why? They had with their eyes violated his holiness. Several years later, when... King David ordered the ark moved from Shiloh. The priests were transporting the ark on an ox cart, not the way God told them to do it. When the oxen stumbled and the ark was about to topple, a man named Uzzah put out his hand to steady the ark. He just wanted to make sure the ark didn't fall to the ground. That's all he wanted to do. But what did God do as a result of him touching the ark? God struck Uzzah dead on the spot for violating his holiness. Nobody touches my ark. He had ordered through his prophet Moses that no one was to touch that ark under any circumstances. And that's what happens when you don't raise your little boy to understand the meaning of the word no. There's a reason why children have to be taught no. Because someday they're going to be in a position where God says no and they're going to do it anyway and he's going to kill them. David was afraid of God that day. First Chronicles chapter 13 verse 12. Finally, when Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 5, God killed them. So why did God kill them? They, by lying, violated His holiness, and great fear came upon all the church. Acts chapter 5, verse 11. Perhaps you have blasphemed God or taken His name in vain. Maybe you think it's clever to live in a Christian home and then say nasty words when nobody's around. Maybe you've lied to the Holy Spirit of God and promised and vowed and have not kept the vow. Yet you've not been struck dead. Does this mean you've nothing to fear in connection with God's holiness? Not at all. 
It only means that God's holiness has not yet been vindicated. And if you laugh and joke and treat lightly the holiness of God who has commanded, Be ye holy, for I am holy, it only means you do not know His holiness. It only means I have identified yet another subject about which you are profoundly ignorant. Fifth, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know His wrath. Laugh about hell all you want, the place you will go as soon as you die. Joke about joining your buddies there for a cold beer all you want. That's what evil Knievel's line used to be. Yeah, I go to hell, I just have a few buds with my buds. Refuse to think about it in the hopes that this place of torment will simply go away. But you know as well as I do that there is something in the heart of an individual that knows, that knows deep down inside him that there is a judgment day coming. And that until that final judgment day, you will be in God's holding cell, a place called hell. On that judgment day that is headed your way, you will stand before this God who you do not fear, This God who you refuse to think about, this God who you refuse to bend your knee to or bow your head to, on the judgment of that great day when death and hell will stand before him, there will then be no arrogance, no cockiness, no apathy, no pretended lack of concern for your Welfare, but that's your future, not mine. In the here and now, there you sit, afraid of being sent to prison should you be guilty of committing a serious crime, if you have any brains. Perhaps afraid of your spouse leaving you should you commit serious sins, if you have any brains. Or afraid of fouling up on a job that you love for fear of being fired, if you have any brains. But without any fear of the wrath of the God you sin against each and every day. Amazing, isn't it? Isn't it amazing? How is it that a man can be afraid of what his friends think? Afraid of taking a stand for what's right in the face of many who are doing wrong. And yet not be afraid of God's wrath. It's simple. The answer to that question is simple. You do not know God's wrath. If you knew, you would fear God. Listen to the testimony of a wise man concerning God's wrath. Would you call yourself a wise person? Does anybody who know you think of describing you as a wise person? Probably not. So it's good to pay attention to the opinion of a wise man, though those who are not wise demonstrate their lack of wisdom by routinely not listening to the testimonies of the wise. But this is what we find in Job chapter 31, verse 23. Destruction from God was a terror to me. Sixth, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know his sovereignty. Psalm 146, verse 10. The Lord shall reign forever, even thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise ye the Lord. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 15 and 16. By me, kings reign, and princes decree justice. By me, princes rule, and nobles, even all the judges of the earth. I didn't say that. Solomon didn't say that. God said that. There is a bit of the control freak in everyone. People just do not like to think about the fact that they're not in control of their own lives. I remember one time, many, many years ago, long before, um, who is the guy who does the, uh, who does the, uh, the financial counseling on the radio? Dave Ramsey? Long before Dave Dave Ramsey, there was a a Christian uh, finance expert, and he went to Tennessee Temple. I can't remember his name. I remember Ron Manugian and I went to a seminar. He said, he said, <laughs> he said, guys, I want to talk to you about God's authority today, but the first thing that comes to my mind is my son. He says, yeah, my son. 
He's decided that there's too many rules at our house. He doesn't like anybody telling him what to do. So guess what he did? He joined the Marine Corps. That's smart. Okay. Everybody likes to be somewhat of a control freak. And, 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 even, and, and they convince themselves where they're giving up so much control that they're actually acquiring control. I'm of the opinion that this is precisely why people are so opposed to the sovereignty of God. They're scared of it. Some, some reason that they, that uh, the same reason is, is why some people don't like to ride with other people in a car because they want to be the one behind the steering wheel. Okay? Uh, and I know when you get old and doddering, you always let your wife drive. Is that right, Lee? Yeah, that's right. Uh, but when you're young and, and, you're, and you're vigorous and all that kind of stuff and you want to be in control and you, and you trust your reflexes and, and your driving skill and ability, you want to be behind the wheel because you don't trust anybody else. I understand that. You want control. But what is the sovereignty of God? Sovereignty, sovereignty has to do with God's absolute rule. It has to do with God being in complete control and can this not evoke fear in the hearts of men? Job 25, verse 2, dominion and fear are with him. Dominion and fear are with him. And this speaks of God's rule. Psalm 33 and verse 8, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. Why would a lost person... Fear the sovereignty of God. Why would a sinner be motivated to fear God's absolute control over all things? Listen to what Jonah said from the belly of the great fish. He said, salvation is of the Lord. In the most helpless and hopeless predicament that he had ever in his lifetime been, he recognized salvation is of the Lord. Listen to what the Lord Jesus told his enemies in John chapter 6, verses 43 and 44. He said, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Listen to what John wrote in, 1 John, in John chapter 1, verse 13. Listen to what John wrote in John chapter 1, verse 13. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And this is speaking about the salvation of your eternal and undying soul. When a sinner becomes mindful of his eternal destiny, and then when he becomes aware that the destiny of his soul is at God's disposition, and he cannot just decide whenever he wants to be saved, it frightens him. And it ought to frighten him. It scares him. And it ought to scare him. It may even terrify him. And he would be well served by being terrified by that reality. He doesn't like the fact that he is not in charge of his own life and that he does not rule over his own destiny, that the disposition of his soul is in the hands of another. He doesn't like that, but better in his hands than in yours. His entire life has been about rebellion against God and personal independence and autonomy and the fact that he is all wrong about everything is something that he doesn't want to think about. You're just wrong about everything. Well, I don't want to go there. But the sovereignty of God doesn't frighten you at all. It doesn't, doesn't scare you at all. You want to know why? Never think about it. Why does the sovereignty of God not bother you? Because you're dead. You're spiritually dead. Because you're blind. You're spiritually blind. Because you're deaf. Spiritually deaf. Because your heart is stone cold. Your conscience, it's seared. 
if you were a sensible person, God's sovereignty would strike fear in your heart. But the fact that you do not fear God's sovereignty shows you are not a sensible person. Finally, if you do not fear God, it is because you do not know his grace. The grace of God really has to do with those here whose sins are forgiven and who know God through his beloved son, Jesus Christ. So I'll point out only one thing concerning those who know God's grace, knowing also the fear of God. Writing to those who had already tasted the grace of God in salvation and the forgiveness of sins that comes from knowing Jesus Christ, listen to what the writer of Hebrews says to Christians in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 28 and 29. Let us have grace whereby we may have... I'm having a hard time talking tonight. Let me back up and make another run at it. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Next sentence. For our God is a consuming fire. Whoa. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So the writer of Hebrews exhorts those the letter was directed to to seek more grace and points out the connection between serving God and the fear of God. Yes, there was a connection between serving God and the fear of God. A person becomes a Christian when realizing that he is estranged from the God of the Bible by his personal sin, he flees to God's Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior we are told of in the Bible, for forgiveness, for cleansing, and for refuge. This will not happen apart from the Holy Spirit of God using the truth of the Bible by means of preaching to reprove sinners, to convict sinners of their plight and the wickedness of their sins against so great a God as our God and then to work repentance and faith in Christ, thereby saving them that believe. Then, once converted, the Christian continues to fear God because of the inestimable greatness of God. As Job chapter 13, verse 11 says, Shall not His excellency make you afraid? And so the more of God's excellency you discover as a Christian through study and prayer and experience, the more fearful of God you become. So the fear of God is a wonderful thing. The fear of God is a healthy thing. The fear of God is a pleasant thing to God. But you do not fear God. And that, my friend, is one of God's chief complaints against you. As you continue your pattern of rebellion and revolt against him, that is God's chief complaint. Paul wrote about you and others like you in Romans chapter 3 and verse 18 where we read, There is no fear of God before their eyes. That there is no fear can only mean that you have no real fear knowledge of God for if you knew anything of God anything you would fear him let us pray father we thank you for your word we appreciate you we love you we love you we find it a truly remarkable act of mercy and grace that you have revealed yourself to us in the word of God and you have moved in some of our lives in such a way that being convicted of sin by the spirit of God you have drawn us to your son Jesus Christ for salvation full and free and for that we are overwhelmed with gratitude and appreciation and we find it remarkable we find it Astounding, we find it incredible, we find it tragic that those that we know and those that we love, those that we care for, those that we pray for, those that we witness to 
they seem to have no fear. They are so dead. They are so lost. And so we plead with you because it must come from you. It can come from no one else. We plead with you to work the great miracle of the new birth that they might be born again. Bless, Father, in this way. And we will thank you and we will praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Good night and God bless you and try to make it home without getting arrested.